The Vicar of Wakefield by Oliver Goldsmith Recorded for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 16 The family use art which is opposed with still greater. Whatever might have been Sophia's sensations, the rest of the family was easily consoled for Mr. Burchell's absence by the company of our landlord, whose visits now became more frequent and longer. Though he had been disappointed in procuring my daughters the amusements of the town, as he designed, he took every opportunity of supplying them with those little recreations which our retirement would admit of. He usually came in the morning, and while my son and I followed our occupations abroad, he sat with the family at home and amused them by describing the town, with every part of which he was particularly acquainted. He could repeat all the observations that were retailed in the atmosphere of the playhouses, and had all the good things of the high wits by rote long before they made way into the jest books. The intervals between conversation were employed in teaching my daughters piquet, or sometimes in setting my two little ones to box to make them sharp, as he called it. But the hopes for having him for a son-in-law in some measure blinded us to all his imperfections. It must be owned that my wife laid a thousand schemes to entrap him, or, to speak it more tenderly, used every art to magnify the merit of her daughter. If the cakes at tea eat short and crisp, they were made by Olivia. If the gooseberry wine was well knit, the gooseberries were of her gathering. It was her fingers which gave the pickles their peculiar green, and in the composition of a pudding it was her judgment that mixed the ingredients. Then the poor woman would sometimes tell the squire that she thought him and Olivia extremely of a size, and would bid both stand up to see which was tallest. These instances of cunning which she thought impenetrable, yet which everybody saw through, were very pleasing to our benefactor, who gave every day some new proofs of his passion, which, though they had not arisen to proposals of marriage, yet we thought fell but little short of it. And his slowness was attributed sometimes to native bashfulness, and sometimes to his fear of offending his uncle. An occurrence, however, which happened soon after, put it beyond a doubt that he designed to become one of our family. My wife even regarded it as an absolute promise. My wife and daughters, happening to return a visit to neighbour Flanborough's, found that, that family had lately got their pictures drawn by a limner, who travelled the country and took likenesses for fifteen shillings a head. As this family and ours had long a sort of rivalry in point of taste, our spirit took the alarm at this stolen march upon us, and, notwithstanding all I could say, and I said much, it was resolved that we should have our pictures done too. Having therefore engaged the limner, for what could I do, our next deliberation was to show the superiority of our taste in the attitudes. As for our neighbour's family, there were seven of them, and they were drawn with seven oranges, a thing quite out of taste, no variety in life, no composition in the world. We desired to have something in a brighter style, and, after many debates, at length came to an unanimous resolution of being drawn together in one large historical family piece. This would be cheaper, since one frame would serve for all, and it would be infinitely more genteel for all families of any taste were now drawn in the same manner. As we did not immediately recollect an historical subject to hit us, we were contented each with being drawn as independent historical figures. My wife desired to be represented as Venus, and the painter was desired not to be too frugal of his diamonds in her stomacher and hair. Her two little ones were to be as cupids by her side, while I, in my gown and band, was to present her with my books on the Wistonian controversy. Olivia would be drawn as an Amazon sitting upon a bank of flowers, dressed in a green Joseph richly laced with gold and a whip in her hand. Sophia was to be a shepherdess with as many sheep as the painter could put in for nothing, and Moses was to be dressed out with an hat and white feather. Our taste so much pleased the squire that he insisted on being put in as one of the family in the character of Alexander the Great at Olivia's feet. 
This was considered by us all as an indication of his desire to be introduced into the family, nor could we refuse his request. The painter was therefore set to work, and as he wrought with assiduity and expedition, in less than four days the whole was completed. The piece was large, and it must be owned he did not spare his colours, for which my wife gave him great encomiums. We were all perfectly satisfied with his performance, but an unfortunate circumstance had not occurred till the picture was finished, which now struck us with dismay. It was so very large that we had no place in the house to fix it. How we all came to disregard so material a point is inconceivable, but certain it is we had been all greatly remiss. The picture, therefore, instead of gratifying our vanity as we hoped, leaned in a most mortifying manner against the kitchen wall where the canvas was stretched and painted, much too large to be got through any of the doors and the jest of all our neighbours. One compared it to Robinson Crusoe's long boat, too large to be removed. Another thought it more resembled a reel in a bottle. Some wondered how it could be got out, but still more were amazed how it ever got in. But though it excited the ridicule of some, it effectually raised more malicious suggestions in many. The squire's portrait being found united with ours was an honour too great to escape envy. Scandalous whispers began to circulate at our expense, and our tranquillity was continually disturbed by persons who came as friends to tell us what was said of us by enemies. These reports we always resented with becoming spirit, but scandal ever improves by opposition. We once again therefore entered into a consultation upon obviating the malice of our enemies, and at last came to a resolution which had too much cunning to give me entire satisfaction. It was this. As our principal object was to discover the honour of Mr. Thornhill's addresses, my wife undertook to sound him by pretending to ask his advice in the choice of an husband for her eldest daughter. If this was not found sufficient to induce him to a declaration, it was then resolved to terrify him with a rival. To this last step, however, I would by no means give my consent, till Olivia gave me the most solemn assurances that she would marry the person provided to rival him upon this occasion, if he did not prevent it by taking her himself. Such was the scheme laid, which, though I did not strenuously oppose, I did not entirely approve. The next time, therefore, that Mr. Thornhill came to see us, my girls took care to be out of the way, in order to give their mamma an opportunity of putting her scheme in execution. But they only retired to the next room, from whence they could overhear the whole conversation. My wife artfully introduced him by observing that one of the Miss Flanboroughs was likely to have a very good match of it in Mr. Spanker. To this the squire assenting, she proceeded to remark that they who had warm fortunes were always sure of getting good husbands. "'But heaven help,' continued she, "'the girls that have none. What signifies beauty, Mr. Thornhill, or what signifies all the virtue and all the qualifications in the world in this age of self-interest? It is not, what is she, but what has she, is all the cry.' "'Madam,' returned he, "'I highly approve the justice as well as the novelty of your remarks, and if I were a king, it should be otherwise. It should then, indeed, be fine times with the girls without fortunes. Our two young ladies should be the first for whom I would provide. Ah, sir, returned my wife, you are pleased to be facetious, but I wish I were a queen, and then I know where my eldest daughter should look for an husband. But now that you've put it in my head, seriously, Mr. Thornhill, can't you recommend me a proper husband for her? She is now nineteen years old, well-grown and well-educated, and, in my humble opinion, does not want for parts. Madam, replied he, if I were to choose, I would find out a person possessed of every accomplishment that can make an angel happy. One with prudence, fortune, taste and sincerity, such, madam, would be, in my opinion, the proper husband." Ay, sir, said she, but do you know of any such person? No, madam, returned he, it is impossible to know any person that deserves to be her husband. She's too great a treasure for one man's possession. She's a goddess. Upon my soul I speak what I think. She's an angel. 
Ah, Mr. Thornhill, you only flatter my poor girl, but we have been thinking of marrying her to one of your tenants, whose mother is lately dead and who wants a manager. You know whom I mean, Farmer Williams, a warm man, Mr. Thornhill, able to give her good bread, and who has several times made her proposals, which was actually the case. But, sir, concluded she, I should be glad to have your approbation of our choice. How, madam, replied he, my approbation, my approbation of such a choice? Never. What? Sacrifice so much beauty and sense and goodness to a creature insensible of the blessing? Excuse me, I can never approve of such a piece of injustice. And I have my reasons. Indeed, sir, cried Deborah, if you have your reasons, that's another affair. But I should be glad to know those reasons. Excuse me, madame, returned he, they lie too deep for discovery, laying his hand upon his bosom. They remain buried, riveted here. After he was gone, upon general consultation, we could not tell what to make of these fine sentiments. Olivia considered them as instances of the most exalted passion. But I was not quite so sanguine. It seemed to me pretty plain that they had more love than matrimony in them. Yet, whatever they might portend, it was resolved to prosecute the scheme of Farmer Williams, who from my daughter's first appearance in the country, had paid her his addresses. End of chapter